get to it. And you know what? We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We're doing it. We're it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be so good. So good. People are gonna love it. They're People gonna are gonna love it. it. And then we're gonna go viral. We're gonna finish filming within 30 minutes because we just know Knows our stuff everything about this. This. Here we go. Let's talk about it. Ready? And I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary, my dear. Where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today we're gonna do a deep dive into what hunger really is. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. This video is very exciting because it's the beginning of a series that we're doing on appetite and hunger and what drives us to eat. And like eating is like one of the, actually probably like after breathing, the first thing that we do. But it's so, so, so complex and there's so many different layers to it. I'm very excited about this series as well. It's incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. Like going into preparing for this video, I knew it was going to be complex, mm -hmm. but I'm still kind of taken aback by the depth and level of complexity. I feel a little done dirty by my education. I know, they definitely oversimplified <laughs> it. Intense oversimplification and maybe even misrepresentation that we were kind of talking about. about. But we're gonna give you the real deal. The real deal. But having said all that, it is going to take more than one video to really do it justice. So stay tuned for our future it's videos. Great. You gotta start off with the basics. You gotta walk before you can run. Today is the most basic physiology of why you are hungry. You have your brain involved, you have your gut hormones involved, and a lot of communication back and forth to try and keep some semblance of homeostasis. Typically when you think of hunger, you would think about like that sensation right here mm -hmm. where you hear the growling, you feel that weird like gnawing sensation if you haven't eaten in a long time. And I think we think like that's what hunger is, but really there's like so much stuff going on. But today we're gonna talk about all the communication that's happening, all the signals your body's telling you to either eat or to stop eating. And that, and how, there goes speaking of all that <laughs> my stomach is growling quite aggressively hunger and appetite i think they're often used interchangeably at mm -hmm. least like in the colloquial like day-to-day -day sense but there's actually very specific definitions and they're not exactly the same thing hunger is biological and physiological in nature it's where your body is recognizing that there is a need for nourishment a need for food and it sends all these signals to let you know that, to encourage you to take in more food. That's kind of more of what we're gonna be talking about today. Whereas we have appetite, and appetite is what drives you to take in food for any reason. So hunger is more like, oh, we need energy. Appetite, it can include hunger, but also includes all these external factors of environment, what it looks like, what it smells like. Appetite, it plays a role in why you would eat even if you didn't have hunger and I know I do that. You walk by a bakery and, like, and that smell hits you. Well, like, I need that. You need it. Or you're at a social event and there's like chips and cheese and all the stuff out there. You're going to eat because the food is delicious and it's there. We just heard Rubina's stomach growling. It's been a minute since I've eaten <laughs> and it's letting me know. So let's talk about what's happening on the inside right now. So you don't eat for a while and one of the ways that your body knows that is your blood sugar, your blood glucose is getting a little lower than it normally would be. And there's some other processes in your body that are changing and this is a signal that ooh, we haven't eaten in a while. So in response, your stomach produces a hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is kind of a meal stimulator in the sense that we notice that ghrelin levels are higher before eating and after you take in food, ghrelin levels drop. And the interesting thing about ghrelin, it is actually the only hormone that we have confirmed plays a role in telling you you're hungry. That's like in your gut. When it's up, you're hungry. When it's down, you're less hungry. What's really interesting is that we see that there's an inverse relationship between ghrelin and adiposity. The more fat tissue there is, there tends to be lower levels of ghrelin. Which is interesting because you would think that it would be the opposite because typically adiposity is your body storing excess energy. Excess energy comes from eating more. So, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, if someone has more fat mass, they probably eat more and so maybe they would have more ghrelin driving them to eat. 
but that's actually not what we see. And I think this kind of highlights the fact that, you know, appetite and hunger, as we kind of mentioned a few times in the beginning, it's very complex mm -hmm. and, you know, the physiological stimulation of hunger is just one component of what contributes to food intake. And obesity itself and weight gain itself is influenced by a lot of different variables beyond food intake. So how does ghrelin make you hungry? So ghrelin, as Layla said, is produced mostly in the stomach, but it's a hormone and hormones generally, they tell some part of your body to do something. So in this case, ghrelin actually goes to your hypothalamus, which is a almond shaped thing in your brain, and it prompts it to release two neuropeptides, a goody related peptide and neuropeptide Y. And both of these peptides stimulate hunger and generally lead to increased food intake. There's been a bunch of studies in rats where they like inject them with these two peptides and we see that they eat more and when that's done consistently they end up with higher levels of autoposity. What's very interesting is that you know we feel all these feelings in our body but really it's our brain that does everything. It's kind of true for everything, mm. right? Like even like sight and smell and hearing and everything like the like our ears and our nose and our eyes, they're just the collector of information. Mm -hmm. And the brain's actually processing it and telling you what the information is. And ghrelin is released from here. But ghrelin is going to your brain and your brain is making the the neuropeptides that say you are hungry. That's the main mechanism that drives hunger and food intake in people. But what about the flip side? What makes us feel full and satisfied and tell us that we do not need to eat anymore? There are a lot of different hormones that do this. A surprising number of hormones like, involved in telling us that we don't need to eat anymore. I know, we have ghrelin's the one where it's up, we're like, we need to eat, and this is the one, pretty much. There's like some that like people discovered in like 2013, but people are like, mm, is it, does it, does it, and other people It's like, actually interesting how little we still know about our bodies, but that's a whole other That's a whole other topic. Like, let's say you're yes. Rabina, and yes. your stomach was growling, and you said, you know what, I'm gonna make some chocolate chip cookies because we're gonna make some chocolate chip cookies right after this. And so you make your chocolate chip cookies and you're not influenced at all by the smell or the delicious taste or anything like that. This is purely energy. This is purely- I'm genuinely hungry genuinely and hungry. I could use some carbs. So what happens? And I think the best place to start would be back at ghrelin. Rabina eats her cookies and her ghrelin levels go down. And the more cookies she eats, the more the ghrelin goes down. And so now your hypothalamus is getting less ghrelin. And so it's like, oh, I'm not getting this ghrelin anymore. I don't need to produce neuropeptide Y and the agouti related peptide. That means that we're no longer signaling that we're hungry. So now I am eating these cookies. They're delicious. They're wonderful. They have a lot of carbs in them. And my body's like, wow, there's a lot of carbs coming in here. I better produce some insulin. Your pancreas produces and releases insulin. So insulin does a bunch of things involving, you know, blood glucose and stuff. But what it also does is it goes to your hypothalamus and tells it to inhibit the production of neuropeptide Y. So basically doing the opposite thing of ghrelin. Ghrelin was saying, hey, more neuropeptide Y, and insulin is saying, no, no more neuropeptide Y. So it's again kind of fighting against that appetite stimulation. It's trying to reduce your appetite. I think the coolest thing for me is like how much our bodies do that we just have no, like no conscious awareness. Yes. Which is a good thing, because I mean, if you had to consciously keep yourself breathing, mm -hmm. keep your heart beating, breaking down food, if you were consciously involved in that, I mean, we'd all die the first time we go to sleep. 100%. First of all, we just get to like go to our jobs and do things that our bodies are just like working away, doing all these other things. Mm -hmm. And actually speaking of, of insulin, people with like type one diabetes, their pancreas doesn't produce insulin. And so they have to do it themselves. And I see, you know, how difficult that is for so many people who have type one diabetes. And it just shows that that's one hormone. Just having to do that one thing manually is very strenuous. It's burdensome. Burbina just had her cookies. Her blood sugar went up, her insulin was released insulin went up across the blood-brain barrier went into her brain to the hypothalamus and said 
No more NPY. Stop, Stop it. it. Why? It's been about an hour or two. The rest of the cookie has made its way down. It's in my intestines now. And my intestines are like, oh, we just got some food. We better release some peptide YY. Or PYY, yeah. you can also <laughs> call it. And then PYY goes to the hypothalamus and it does very similar things to the insulin in the sense that it also goes there and says, no more NPY, stop making her hungry. We have enough food. But then it also does this extra thing of stimulating this thing called POMC or P-O-M-C or pro-opio-melanocortin. And that's a neuropeptide from your hypothalamus that says, we're not hungry. Mm -hmm. No hunger, we're satiated, we good. We good. That's produced an hour or two after you eat. The amount that's released is proportional to the amount that you ate. And I know that seems really intuitive, but you know, if you think about it, you know, we just think, oh, I eat more, I'm less hungry afterwards, I eat less, I'll be more hungry afterwards. But like the amount of like little things that are happening to that make actually make that happen, happen yeah. is insane. And it kind of shows how good your body is at wanting to keep like you know within a certain range of energy for the day i feel like homeostasis is like the central theme of like biology and physiology almost yeah homeostasis is just basically the way that your body keeps things just regular stable, just stable. if you go up it'll bring you back, back down. down if you go down a little bit it tries to bring you back up and interestingly even beyond insulin and peptide yy there's even a bunch more mm -hmm. like hormones that do the same thing in the sense of inhibiting those neuropeptides in your hypothalamus that tell you that you're hungry it inhib inhibits those and stimulates other neuropeptides that also tell you that you're not hungry so those include things like CCK, which is cholecystokinin, things like pancreatic peptide, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide, one, GIP, all kinds of different abbreviations that all work together to keep that fine balance of like energy intake to energy output. Rabina and I have talked about, we met through our undergrad program, but really actually interacted because we worked in a research lab. And the main focus of that lab was looking at things that cause fullness and things that cause people to eat more or not eat as much and like how different foods and nutrients cause that to happen. We actually measured all of this for a bunch of different foods in children. And basically all these hormones are found in your blood and so we used to like not we because i'm not a nurse but we were there while this yeah. was happening and so we'd have a nurse come in and take blood from children <laughs> yeah that sounds, sounds so bad. really bad but in the study of science in the sake of science there was a all informed consent, consent assent all, all, everything all the proper they got paid things, for it. appropriate compensation went through the research session board but basically these participants they come into the lab after an overnight fast We'd collect the blood, we'd ask them how hungry they are and all how much they want to eat. Then they'd be given a certain food. And then for about two hours after at regular intervals, we'd kind of collect more blood and ask those same questions and then see how, you know, the blood values, how those hormones, whether they do associate or correlate with their perception of their hunger and appetite. And then even after that, we would see how much they ate at the next meal, which is really interesting is, you know, does how hungry you feel and the levels of these hormones play into, you know, how much you do actually eat at the next meal. That's science that's like currently happening at the lab that we used to work at. And it just shows how on the, like, we're, we don't know that much about this yet. What we talked about just now is all in the short term. You know, Rubina was hungry, she ate her cookies, all this stuff changed. But we do have one hormone that kind of just goes up and down as the day goes on. And as far as we know, there's not really a release of it based on a meal that you just had. And that hormone is called leptin. Leptin is affectionately called the satiety hormone because basically it reduces your appetite. Leptin is produced by the fat cells in your body. And what's really interesting is that if you have more fat cells, you're gonna have more leptin in your body. Hypothetically, leptin is kind of there to keep you in, you know, the same 
kind of range of weight. As Layla mentioned, leptin, it's not really triggered or inhibited by the food intake directly. It actually seems to be associated with the circadian rhythm. So we actually see that leptin is at the highest levels around like midnight and into the early hours of the morning, which I wonder if it's because, you know, your body wants you to be asleep, you know, when the sun is down. That's and a really good point. If you were hungry during that time, your quality of sleep would be compromised. A hundred percent. The way that leptin works is really similar to all of the other hormones we've mentioned already. It's produced, it goes up to your brain, and it stimulates the release of the palm C. Yes, <laughs> pro opiomelanocortin. Exactly. But it also stimulates the release of something called cocaine and amphetamine regulated transcript or cart, which also reduces appetite. Exactly. We put a lot of emphasis on how our bodies have so many mechanisms in place to keep things stable. You know, if your energy levels are going down, your stomach is growling, you're hungry, it tells you to eat, then you eat, and then your body's like, you can stop eating now. So if this is all at play constantly, then why do we see what we see in the world with the situation of obesity rates going up and you know a lot of people wanting to lose weight and you know struggling with weight change why do we still see that you know that's a really really good question and that's kind of like the heart of this series that we're gonna dive into so today was like the basic physiology and you know for a really long time like scientists were really trying to focus on this like basic physiology piece and be like oh well if people are overweight it's because they have something wrong with their hormones but that's kind of like a little bit of a dated way of thinking and you know there's a lot of drugs that were trying to be developed like changing these hormones and all these different things but what we're seeing now is it's not just these hormones that are at play we have the environment we have hyperpatible foods we have marketing we have all these different things that play into what and how we eat you hear the term hyperpalatable foods and it's basically foods that are just they tend to be you know high sodium high fat high sugar these foods that you know are just incredibly delicious whether it's like chips or candy or chocolate and you know a lot of these foods they're actually very intentionally designed to not really interact with the systems that we talked about today. The ultimate takeaway here is that, you know, hunger and appetite are incredibly complex mechanisms and there's a complex interplay with the environment, your emotions, your body, how much you eat and so, so many variables. And today we've just scratched the surface and talked about the very basics of the hormonal and physiological one tiny aspect of that entire picture. So from, you know, a hormonal physiological perspective, basically various parts of your digestive system, whether it's your stomach, or your pancreas or your intestines, they release hormones to communicate to your brain where you're at with your energy levels. Your brain then releases neuropeptides to then drive behavior to either take in more food or reduce food intake. I am so excited. I hope you're excited. Too. I'm really excited. Actually, you pitched this idea and I think it's a brilliant idea. It's, it's so complex and there's so many nuances to it. I think like the physiological aspect, it's like a bit more concrete in the exactly. I mean, there's still things that we're still learning as a scientific community, <laughs> but nonetheless, like, I think there's a lot of other aspects of this that are emerging. This is like, it's emerging. emerging. There's controversial elements to it. There are things that are, we're still sorting through the science. So honestly, I'm going to learn along with all of you. Thank you so, so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss one of our videos and follow us on our Instagram and our TikTok. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.